First of all, I think to set the scene, we need to look at the decline of local abattoirs. In the 1930s, there were something like 30,000 abattoirs in the UK. By the year 1971, there were under 2,000, and the latest is around 248, 249. They're closing fairly regularly, so it's a bit of a job to keep track of them. And these closures are not just across the board. If we look at the decline of the smaller rather than the larger abattoirs, in the 10 years between 2007 and 2017, you'll see that the smallest, there was a 34% closure rate uh, in that 10-year period, whereas the largest actually went up in numbers by 9%. This gives you an idea of the, uh, the, the sort of scattering of them, and you can see straight away big areas where there's really nothing very much. Uh, this excludes, uh, uh, includes non-stun non halal, uh, which some people may not, not want to use, and the figures from Northern Ireland, which are almost like state secrets to try and get hold of, there's only about 13 of them. Okay, so why the decline? There's lots of reasons, and other people, I think, are going to expand on, on a number of these points, but I'll just quickly go through them. Uh, having run a cutting plant myself for about 20 years, regulations and paperwork is, is one of the major ones. It is uh, getting beyond a joke. Low profitability of, of abattoirs across the sector being forced down by the ones at the very top who have the economies of scale is another major factor. Waste disposal uh, prices are going up, whereas the prices for hides and skins, which in years gone by, as I'm sure John will tell us, used to pay for the, the cost of slaughter. There is overcapacity, as uh, the bureaucrats will tell you, there is overcapacity within the sector, but the point is the overcapacity is in the largest sector. And uh, it's, it's, to be frank, it's not the best, most attractive work in the country, uh, and finding good people is quite difficult, uh, and therefore the uh, average age of, of abattoir owners is around the 60 mark. To misquote Mr. Cleese, what have small abattoirs ever done for us? Not a lot really, apart from the direct jobs and the ancillary businesses that can develop uh, in areas where they exist, the reduction in food miles and therefore assistance to the environment, um, and those consumers of course, to enable them to have a real choice. This whole argument is based on the fact that if we don't have small abattoirs, we don't have local traceable meat, full stop. Uh, animal welfare, very important because it reduces miles to be slaughtered. And economic development for the local community, much more money that stays within the local community than if you have a big multinational running a massive factory type operation. Uh, and it's a source of product innovation. Uh, many of the ideas that have developed in the meat industry come from the smaller companies, as it does in any industry. So what can be done? Uh, our report comes out with a number of recommendations, which I'll go through briefly. And firstly, to, for the government to publicly recognise the importance of maintaining this network of smaller abattoirs for the public good that they produce, which I mentioned earlier, for the delivery of this local traceable meat without which, without them, that could not happen. Uh, and because many farmers have been paid good public money for diversifying, particularly to have their own meat um, marketed by themselves, and if they can't market it, that's a waste of public money. And, and we're asking for the government to take this as a matter of practical policy across all government uh, levels. The second one is to undertake or set up an urgent in-depth review of the whole sector. We know some of the answers, we don't know all of the answers, and what we don't want is, is an elastoplast. We want the job done properly for a sustainable future. So it needs uh, identifying the problems that are there now, what can be done to overcome those problems to enable the existing people to continue, and what is needed to allow both static and mobile abattoirs to operate in areas where currently there are no private kill facilities. And the third one is on-farm slaughter. 
uh, to consider what the practical barriers are and again to come up with a plan to overcome that because for many people again as we'll hear from Paddy in a minute this is considered the, 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 the top level of animal welfare. So without urgent action to assist smaller abattoirs does local traceable uh, and traceable meat have a future? And of course, what we all hope is, yes, it does. But if it does, something has to be done very urgently. Thank you. So, the challenges facing small abattoirs, I've categorised these into three areas. Waste collection, used to generate an income pre-BSE. These are the kind of costs a little abattoir like ours will face every week. So we've gone from a positive to a negative. We're paying three to four hundred pounds a week to actually get the waste removed where we were actually being paid for it in the past. Because we're only small, we can't separate the waste into, into the uh, specified ruminant material that needs staining blue and the, and the rest of the waste. So we have to put it all in one skip together because we can't get anybody to pick it up. And that's the problem. There is a lack of competition in the industry for picking up waste. And that's perhaps one of the areas that we can look at is if local authorities were to get involved um, with waste recycling and they could take the waste from abattoirs then it would stop certain companies carving it up whereby they don't move from one area to another they all have their own businesses at this service and you can't get somebody to come and quote to collect your waste and, that, and that's the situation we're faced with at the moment um, the other thing is obviously the fifth quarter you know the, um, the things like the, the stomachs and that um, we've actually started a little pet food business on the side. We have a separate barn that's set up as a pet, pet food um, operation, completely separate from the abattoir, and that helps us, again, try and offset some of these costs. Um, but but that's, that's just one of the things we're facing. The other thing is the hide and skin price. Bob alluded to that earlier. My dad, 15 years ago, was getting £6.50 a lambskin. Current price, 20p. Yeah? So can you, you can get a picture now why the small abattoirs are closing. We don't have the economies of scale. The big places, they can get more because they can get bigger pickups. Um, we're actually being charged for pelts 20p. I know that in Wales, some of them have been charged 70p. Some of them are actually skipping them now. Yeah? Um, we used to have a, we used to hand flay all the hides. Now what we actually do is we have a, bought a, a machine to take them off because we've been penalised on the hide price. Um, and we thought, right, that's great, we'll be able to get £45 a hide, then the hide market dropped, we're only getting £24. And these, really, are the things that the small abattoirs use to offset the costs of running their abattoirs and the cost that they would then pass on to farmers for actually for processing their stock. So the, the third thing, and this is the one that really we're trying to concentrate on the moment, is the um, regulations. All the, the amount of paperwork that we have to contend with. If you've like got a, a large abattoir and you're putting through hundreds of animals from one farm, you've one piece of paperwork. When you're dealing with lots of small producers who are all producing six, eight, ten lambs or whatever, you've got all those pieces of paperwork to fill in for all those and you can spend your day just form filling. And these agencies don't talk to each other either. So you can be filling in the same forms for all of them. So we need the government to actually get together and get different agencies to talk to each other to take that paperwork off the small producers because they just haven't the facilities to do it. They cannot allocate a member of staff to paperwork. It's impossible for them. So that, that's a major way we can do it. We have to, like water testing, you can drink it, but you can't wash the slaughterhouse floor with it without testing it. There's lots of things that, you know, that. Are just that they seem absolutely absurd um, we've got like the I mean we all pay a levy as farmers you know and as uh, meat producers as well you know I, I would like to see what the levy is actually being used for now it seems to be used a lot for export but how is that actually supporting the home market well, that, that's another thing perhaps that could be some kind of support that's actually the government can say well the money goes to smaller places um, you know, I, I do feel that, you know, you can see all this documentation here, food chain information, passports, movement licences. The thing is, I mean, the, the reason we've got to have all this is because abattoirs are all over the place. You, you know, they're all big plants now. Animals have to travel further. When there was lots of small plants, 
it wasn't necessary because everybody knew they were coming from the locality. So that's why we've got all these. So every time there's a food scare or a problem, then the legislation doesn't fall on, the, on some of the bigger businesses where this, with the food fraud, with horse meat, the rest of it, it falls on the small ones as well. And we're copying for some of the problems that, that have happened you know, with, with the big plants. We've got things like the anti-mortem inspection. I mean, the anti-mortem inspection, the FSA's own statistics show that it, it's negligible what they actually spot at anti-mortem. And we've always got, at the end of the day, we've got that post-mortem where the meat inspector puts a stamp on to say that it's fit for us to eat. So why are we employing vets to look at animals? Yeah, it should be the responsibility of the food business operator. He should be able to actually say whether the animal's fit. If, he makes, if there's a problem with the animal, it's going to be picked up by an independent inspector at the end. We want that independent stamp. We don't want to regulate ourselves because that gives the public confidence in what we're actually selling. Now, for, I, I'm under the impression that the, since the EU regulations covering abattoirs came to pass, I believe the small abattoir sector has been systematically persecuted almost out of the extinction. Regulations formulated around large plants have been a tool to make small abattoirs just give up. The applications of flexibilities have been poor and a common sense of risk-based assessment has been completely lacking. We desperately need a risk-based approach to the regulation of small plants and I know that um, Tasha and AHO will actually, because that's, the, that's what we have like in shops and retail establishments, we have a risk-based assessment system. That's what we need for small abattoirs. So without small abattoirs, you'll find it harder to source lo local meat. You won't be able to sell it to the public. It'll have to go off to a faceless plant miles away. Farmers who want to grow their own animals and sell them the meat will find it harder to make margin as they have to travel greater distances. And they won't have somebody who can actually add value to the product through the facilities that a small abattoir has. We do all this for our farmers, yeah? We won't just kill the animal. We'll cure the pig, we'll make sausages out of it, it all means that the farmer can sell it direct to a consumer and they can actually, you know, they, they've got the whole history behind it and this is something that large plants wouldn't touch with a barge pole, yeah? So if you've got a business set up for doing that, I've put that on there so you can see some of your farmers are using local kill facilities, what, what we actually charge. Um, it's important that we have a sustainable framework in which small plants can work. I know there is talk of one-off grant aid. At the end of the day, that won't work. We need a proper framework and a proper risk-based system of meat inspection in this country for small abattoirs, and that will ensure their future, not a one-off grant. It's got to be something that we can work with. Um, the, the minister, um, Mr Gold, has said that his priority is animal welfare, and I can't understand why he tolerates legislation that closes small businesses unnecessarily and means inevitably animals have to travel further to slaughter, making animal welfare potentially worse. We need to value the slaughtermen as well. The slaughtermen are incredibly skilled. I know when we did the programme Kill It, Cook It, Eat It, we had a chef on board. They didn't even bother with the chef because they found that the actual knife work of the slaughtermen was just incredible. Imagine having a shave with your wrong hand. That's the kind of skill we're talking about. And we've been at government recently over the training of abattoir apprentices coming through. They offered us £2,000 yeah, per apprentice. Yeah. That's how much they value what we actually do. And it's very, very upsetting. But we've actually been back to them now and they've actually upped that to 6000 but a butcher can get 9000 now these apprenticeships, if anybody is from a local abattoir and that, please use that trailblazer apprenticeship because we need those people coming through. But we need a sustainable small abattoir industry for which them to go in first. Number of phone calls I'm receiving at the moment from small abattoir operators who are in their 60s as we've just said and they're saying to me, I've got two sons, should I be encouraging them to carry on with this? It's a very difficult answer for me to give at the moment. Because unless you're actually associated with a retail business, and looking at the figures I've just shown you, I'm sure you can see how hard it is. Now hopefully we can get the message out there. I talk to plants all over the country, I hear every week about them closing. We've had a meeting with the FSA, with Jason Feeney and his colleagues to talk about this. 
And the, the attitude from the colleagues seemed to be as regarding the paperwork, there is some light at the end of the tunnel in combining this paperwork so we can reduce that burden. But, uh, but the things like anti-mortem, because they're enshrined in EU law, seem to be something that's further down the road. My fear is that by the time they get around to sorting that out, that there'll be even less small abattoirs. So we really do need to keep the pressure on government and on the FSA to actually look at this seriously before we're all gone. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is us. Hardy's Mill, uh, in fact, ethical Scotch beef. For us, a bit of bragging rights down the bottom. Uh, why is that a very useful one for us to have? Because it came from a man who did a film called State Revolution, which went right the way around the world. It's a Netflix uh, film, and it's uh, become a global sort of cult for any foodie. Uh, so hugely useful for us. He was also the State World Championship uh, Chief Judge that year, and he was kind enough to put us in the top five, and then top two, top one, We've gone back down again, but we're basically working alongside Roma Gallega and, uh, and Kobe at the moment, is our roundabout where we, we stand. But we thought, with that, if you're that close, you've got to have a go for it. You know, it's going to be number one. You've got to get a bit of control in those areas where we're weak. So if we're going to be stay number one or get back up there, then we had to get a bit more control than we currently had. Why do us, we call ourselves ethical Scotch beef? Well. Why Scotch? Because Scotch is a PGI. Scotch is a, we are in Scotland. Our animals are all born, reared, and slaughtered in Scotland. For us, it's a hugely important umbrella brand, which allows us sort of, for those people who know nothing about us, who've never heard about us, it's a, it's a base level, which is set pretty high. A bit like a French wine, a bit like a German beer. You know you're going to get something drinkable. Now, there are different chateaus in those wines, and there are different beer brew houses in those, in those areas. Same in Scotland, you have different levels of, of producers. We have to find it works very, very well for us. We sort of like to think ourselves as Chateau Latour. It's very arrogant, but it's good for the ego. <laughs> Why ethical? Well, actually, that, that's just showing how hard we are. That's the priest from the east. You guys had it light, I tell you. That's the tractor. It got stuck shortly after that, as you can guess. Um, why ethical? Ethical for us means everything we can possibly do to make that animal's life as good as possible while it is alive. To honour the animal which is going to give its life for our consumption. So we mean from that right from birth through to death and using every part we can and giving it a natural, stress-free environment to live in. Teasy dam, put farm to fork. So by that we mean literally the animals from birth to the moment where we actually, we uh, do a thing called seam cutting, which is, so we, we stake about 65% of the carcass and only mince about 12.5%. Uh, so we try to use every single piece, including the fifth quarter, which you were talking about. Grass reared the whole way through for us. We found it has a, such an impact on the flavour. And also, if you swing between feeds, it has quite an impact that comes through in the meat later. So we, we've stuck to grass, grass all the way. We're in Scotland. We've got a lot of water, as you can see. Um, a lot of water. Um, but that does help the green grass grow. The big white building, locally named Mini Torness, not a helpful comment from our cattlemen because it's just as we're trying to get planning permission through the guy. So it doesn't look like any local building. And the cattleman came back and said, yes, it does. It looks like Tordes, the nuclear power station. <laughs> really helpful. <laughs> that, that put everything back a month. <laughs> but that's the point that we're going to talk about, because that's our new abattoir. The new micro abattoir that we've just built on the farm. And what we've been asked to talk today is, uh, is from a, a wonderful position of ignorance, um, uh, compared to John with his years of operation, is what we would suggest from basis, the time it's taken us to build this, from the moment we started thinking about it, is four years. And what, if anybody here in this room is thinking about doing the same, same thing, then a few points, six points, for you guys to consider before you head down that line. Point one. 
No, and I mean really no, your market. Uh, I'm not just talking about reading a few books, maybe doing a one at a single farmer's market, seeing if your thing, flogging a single sheep. You're talking about putting a lot of throughput over the year, and you've got to be going way beyond selling to your friends and to your friends' friends. You've got to really, really know what that market is. Now, whether your market is going to be looking to sell carcasses or just doing a service for other people, whether you are just doing your own farmer's market, we still do a farmer's market, we absolutely love it, we're heavily involved with Kelso Farmer's Market, my wife and myself, and the children too now, whether you're selling to pubs or to the luxury sector, all those things, and also on the demand side, on the supply side, know that market, because if you don't know that market, then you're far, far better operating with your micro avatar where you've got the traceability and where you can take a lesser risk. Until you've worked it out, don't go in on the deep end because it's going to cost you a lot of money. Point two, looking, look for the point of failure. We were trying to work out, we reckon it condensed down to four things. Setup costs. If you're going to be looking at spending the top end of a million quid, then you've got to have a mighty strong market to sell it to. You know, if you can get that down, obviously it becomes easier to break even. Be very aware of what your setup costs are. You can get them down a lot lower than... But most of the studies are all having it up over a million. You can get it down below there. You can get a long way below there. Which obviously breaks... Your break-even is far, far easier to achieve. Labour. You both said that. Wow. <laughs> and labour is, is two things. Labour is sort of... Those things are, are, are not easy to come by. Um, for us in the borders, we're having to bring them in from England and from, um, from, from further outside. It's the guys with all the ticks in the boxes, because to get the tickets, you have to have, I think it's nine, nine tickets to be a, a fully, fully qualified. So it's, it's a huge number of things. It's a very, very skilled job, and there are not many of them around anymore. So labour, and then you, also the other end of the scale, you're looking for cleaners too. Not many people volunteering, certainly not around us, to, uh, to clean an abattoir. Can't think why. That's what children are for anyway, so we're good for that. <laughs> oh, no, no, never said that. No, no. Oh, it's recorded, it's even worse. Sorry. <laughs> waste. Waste is, um, well, waste, is, is, waste has been covered. Waste is, by goodness, you've got to be careful with the waste as far as we can see. And we spent a lot of time working out what to do with that waste before we even started off down the line. It was, it was flagged up, and it was flagged up as a major problem. And water. You're going to need a lot of water, and you're talking about water in and water out. Both ends has a lot of regulation, and a lot of people with big clipboards and lots of boxes to tick. And it takes a long, long time to get through all those boxes. And a, uh, yeah, and a learning experience. Intellectually, intellectually stimulating, I think is how they said it. Point three. Now, I'd like to say it's a total coincidence that that's the stunning block when we're talking about stunning box when we're talking about honing your political skills. Total coincidence. Can't think why that appeared that way. <laughs> but this is a very, very political exercise. You've got to know when to push, when to give way, when to schmooze, when to, when to escalate up the tree, and when to get whoever you can think of to come and help. You know, be ready to be nice to people. Very nice to people. <laughs> Be ready to exercise your engineering ingenuity. We certainly found that um, theory, even in a turnkey thing that we ended buying, did not quite match up with reality, particularly when you are talking about different national standards. Uh, not least in plumbing, for instance, where certain countries work to 80 mil and we work to 20 mil. But you don't find that until you're trying to plumb it all together. Um, that's the sort of thing where you're going to, you're talking really quite heavy engineering. We were, we were talking wind factors and stuff like that. Turkey operations are good, but you have got to be aware of your local climatic conditions. Where we are, it's extremely blowy. We clock up to 110, 116 miles an hour, and most of these things aren't built for that. So you've got to be, got to, got to be aware of those sort of issues. Think, think them through in advance if you can. Hassops. <laughs> Hassops, I'm sure quite a few people here have met Hassops. Well, John was saying about one for each person, one for each of his customers. Well, for us, when we started, it started off as 72 pages of Hassops before we even started. Uh, Hassop is a hazard analysis for um, 
uh, have critical control points. You're looking for the p political and potential points of failure where things can go badly wrong. Um, a slaughterman once summed it up, which was something to do with being up a, crab, a, a creek without a paddle, you know, if it goes beyond that point, basically. But he used other words in there too. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, point six. Just to say, ask yourself honestly before you go ahead and building your own micro abattoir. Do I have the patience, time, sense of humour to do this? Do I have the reason to do this? And I think, from this whole conference point of view, what happens if I don't? Thank you very much, Tilly. My name's Natasha. I'm here in my personal capacity today, but I am a local authority, local authority um, EHO. Uh, the reason I've come to speak to you today is there are currently exemptions for approval from for small-scale poultry and wild game slaughter that are currently not applied to small-scale red meat, and whether there's potential for that to happen um, as soon as possible, really. I think listening to the other guys here, and some of the premises that we've got locally back in Cornwall um, where they do seem to be struggling against bureaucracy perhaps and the additional costs and everything that could be reduced. Uh, so it's just an overview really. Uh, currently you can slaughter poultry and wild game on the farm and it's not subject to official controls by the Food Standards Agency, um, subject to, to some certain criteria. Um, so the numbers are restricted. Um, you can do less than 10,000 poultry a year, so it's not actually that small scale in the grand scheme of it. The majority of the ones that do on-farm poultry slaughter just do them in the run-up to Christmas, but we have got a few that operate all year round, killing 100 birds a week perhaps, on average. There's no specified numbers for wild game, they used to be, and that's been removed because the FSA believe it's self-limiting with regards to the demand isn't there, maybe quite so much for wild game and the open and closed seasons. Um, to, meet these, another, to meet these restrictions, um, the supply can only go to the final consumer, so you could sell uh, from your farm gates or if you had your own shop or a local farmer's market, or it can go to local retailers or caterers that are supplying the final consumer. Um, local definition is county and neighbouring county. Um, so we can go into local butchers, local pubs, restaurants. Just with regard to wild game, there is a, an accredited qualification. Uh, it's called various different names. Um, hunters, trained hunter. It's a level two qualification that's done in a day. Um, that allows the person shooting the deer, or the person with the person shooting the deer, don't necessarily have to be one that shot it, um, to make a declaration that the animal was normal prior to shooting and that they've checked the, the off-fall um, prior to eviscerating in the field and that everything was normal and it just gets tagged with that declaration and the hunter's number on. Poultry is not subject to any anti-mortem or post-mortem checks um, but one of the restrictions is that it's got to be either hatched on the farm of slaughter or reared for a day-old chick. Uh, so you can't go to the market and buy it. It, it has to be... It sort of controls the disease risks potentially by not moving it from farm to farm. So there's no specific requirement to do any anti-mortem or post-mortem whatsoever. However, the legislation does require people to be trained commensurate to their duties, so it would be expected that whoever's processing them would have some knowledge of illness in the bird prior to, to being slaughtered and fitness of the carcass. Um, both of these activities are regulated by the Environmental Health Department, not the Food Standards Agency. So just looking at really whether it could fit for red meat, um, where we could have some possible equivalent equivalents. So it could be that it's a specified limit on livestock units. I'm reasonably au fait with them, but I believe one cattle is one unit, and what, ten, 10 sheep is a unit, something like that. Yeah. Um, so there's limit, there's livestock units, so there could be specifications um, on, on numbers. Um, again, it could be that the supplies restricted to the final consumer, local retailers and caterers. Um, from what I've seen with the avatars we've got locally, the small ones, I think that they're probably just trading within those, that sort of criteria anyway. Um, potentially the local could be a bit restrictive, maybe whether it could be looked at 
supply to retailers, retailers and caterers within the nation rather than the locality, as long as you can maintain the, the chill chain. Um, then potentially a specific stamp that identifies the abattoir like it does now um, and means it's been through a post-mortem inspection and it's fit to supply, um, but that, that restricts it. But currently at the moment, all the abattoirs have got an EC approval health mark, which means it can go anywhere. So if the lower restrictions, the lower regulations were applied, that it would restrict the supply. Potentially an anti-mortem undertaken by the FBO staff, which goes back to what um, John was saying earlier, is it necessarily necessary for the FSA to do it? Could there be something in line with the wild game training um, to say that the staff meet that qualification and fit to do it? Uh, there is proposals, well it's not proposals now is it, it's coming in for CCTV coverage in the, in the Lairidge. Um, if you've got continuous CCTV, is that a further reason that you don't necessarily need an OV to do a, an anti-mortem? There's a camera there watching it all the time that's going to have to be available to the authorities when they want to see it. Um, and then maybe cold inspection at the end of the day. Um, some of the plants will have there in the morning. Um, then the say they whole processing time. I don't know what they do. Their own work, I suppose, in and out and just check what carcasses they come through, but they could be all checked at the end of the day. So who could regulate it and how? Um, so premises that are exempt currently aren't boy with the legislation, but approved premises are required to comply with one called 853, which is specific to certain products of animal origin, and it puts a higher burden on those businesses. Um, <laughs> The exempt premises aren't regulated using that one. There's a lower legislation which they comply with. And it is deemed sufficient for short local supply chains, but it just doesn't seem to be afforded to revenue slaughter for some reason. I, I don't know why. Um, what it would give is a greater de degree of flexibility in how the FBO can comply. I've looked at it. I believe that there is sufficient stuff in the lower regulations to control what needs to be in place. Um, but because it's worded a little bit less, a little bit more flexibly, um, you, it's not so specific. It gives you more options. At the end of the day, they just need to demonstrate how they're achieving what the law says. Because the law actually, in most cases, just sets a standard. It doesn't tell you how you have to do it. Some people might argue different, but I, I don't think it does. Um, welfare regulations obviously would still apply. Um, I don't think anybody wants to see those go. Um, and they could be regulated by the local authority animal health officers, training standards. Um, and then cold inspection, either undertaken by the FSA or the local authority. There's a lot of PHOs that are trained meat inspectors, don't do it anymore, um, but they could be brought back up to speed, or it could be that the FSA just continue with that cold inspection um, responsibility. Uh, but animal byproducts, hygiene, structure, management systems, going back to HACCP, all love, um, could be regulated by the local authority. Um, there is sufficient enforcement tools already um, to control adherence to the um, exemptions and take action where necessary. There are, we've got legal powers to take to, to stop activities going on if they start trading outside of it. Well, it doesn't have to stop the activities going on, it just brings them back into the exemption criteria and then they can either stay there or they can apply for approval. Um, there is a dedicated schedule already in the domestic hygiene regulations that enforce the EU ones for poultry, um, so whether that could be provided for red meat as well. Uh, so just very quickly, the benefits, what I see, uh, potential reduction in the cost, the official controls, at the moment local authorities don't charge for theirs, the FSA do, that's not to say that won't change, there's a lot of pressures on local authorities to um, obviously reduce their costs and bring in an income, so that, you can't really set that one in stone. Um, but currently there would be no no cost. What you were saying about the testing of water, that doesn't apply to your premises if you're not approved, unless you're under on a private water supply. So there's you know a cost saving there. Um, possibly a greater flexibility of slaughter days and times if you had cold inspection, if you needed to operate on a different day. Or it's just something I thought of. Um, what we've got a problem with in Cornwall is illegal slaughter. Um, where we've got people that offer on-farm slaughter on a, as a full-time job. Um, that has escalated over the years. It started to die back a little bit. But if we, had, if we 
kept the local facilities going, we're less likely to see that start up again. You, you never, you never stop it completely, <coughs> but if they disappear, you're just that's what's going to start up. If you were regulated by the local authority, you would have a reduction in the frequency of your audits. Our inspections are based on risk frequencies. Um, generally, a raw meat butcher, for example, with good compliance levels would be on a three-year audit frequency. Um, it would maintain facilities for local butchers, private kill customers, um, and reducing the distances animals need to travel for slaughter. Less resource intent for the FSA, they're having to save money as well. Um, obviously, the little ones are heavily subsidised, so they're, they're probably actually costing them money, for them, if you looked at it from that point of view. Um, so it, it could be a saving for them as well. So there's just a few ideas um, where potentially it could be a reduction in the burden of the regulation, but still maintaining the same standards to you know, assure the customer that it's all safe. Um, so here at Fur Farm, uh, and I suppose maybe from the School of Salatin and the School of Optimism, uh, I'm going to talk to you about something which I'm not qualified, unlike all this lot here who are hugely qualified people, in talking about abattoirs. But, as I say, our uberization factor today is the fact that we want to work on a similar system that Robin's been doing, but turn it into a mobile system. Uh, the mobile system would be um, <clears throat> owned in a cooperative of farmers working in a hub, uh, which then you could roll out into different areas of the country which need this system. Now, the mobile system obviously has to comply with regulations. There may be a few, uh, a few jobisms thrown in there to get it through, but we're all from the school of optimism. And clearly it has to be economically viable. Um, our main factor here is welfare. This is what we're aiming for. In addition, we believe an on-farm slaughter system would allow us to provide local meat to local customers and complete our vision of circular economy. So our concept, and believe me, we don't have all the answers. We don't pretend to have all the answers. We're on a journey. We want your help. We want your experiences uh, to make this possible. So what we believe has changed to make this possible is in fact regulations do allow on-farm slaughter within parameters. Since 2000 the regulations have definitely become flexible uh, but this is after conversations with FSA who at the moment are very constructive but we've only just started so from listening to this lot it could be a very very long journey but we're optimistic. Um, Brexit whether you like it or not has thrown an opportunity uh, to introduce a new system. Uh, the conversations with the APHA who deal with the waste have been positive and if we can turn waste into a commodity that will change the face of it too. You know, so suddenly a waste, what we call waste, is actually a commodity. It could be composted producing methane which could then generate electricity. It suddenly becomes an on-farm commodity. Uh, the use of modern technology, we've already talking about CCTV. Now, if you could have a live feed from four or five avatars into a vet's hub, where you've got one vet looking at four avatars in the process, if there's a problem, you can ring up and say, hold that animal, I'm coming over to see it. But it would reduce the number of vets required on the scene. Um, computer records, obviously we've already heard from Robin uh, and John about the number of records. Surely there's an easy way to make that more economical and speed the process up. Um, there is the potential for 3D scanning. I don't know if John's seen that at all yet. The idea of 3D scanning carcasses uh, for the uh, inspection process. And we know it's possible to do because Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, Austria have all got systems in place. So it is possible. Uh, our design is basically two trailers. One would be the slaughter trailer, where the animal would be killed in a stun box, craned into the dirty trailer or slaughter trailer, uh, where it would be then skin, bled, head off, feet off, guts out. You then end up with a clean carcass, which is then either transferred into a 
processing trailer, which is basically a chiller trailer, or in fact it could be delivered straight into the farmer's own chiller or taken to uh, a butcher's chiller, depending on how the system is set up. In our case, we're thinking we would have a central hub where you could hang 30 carcasses in a central point. Um, one day, as I said earlier, these tractors and these machinery could be powered from the renewable energy produced from the methane from your commodity, not waste. Um, our system is going to be based basically on operating 46 weeks a year, uh, and that would be killing for three days, processing for two. That equates to uh, a minimum of six cows a week, and probably 75 sheep a week. Um, as we're experiencing at the moment, the or working out from our budgets is the largest costs of running a mobile system apart from labour and the waste is the veterinary costs. But I think with modern technology, I'm sure there are ways we can reduce this. And if we can reduce waste and veterinary costs, we think we can reduce the running of the mobile system by about 30%, which is a significant saving. We would like to operate it with two staff, uh, both being slaughter uh, trained people, and in fact one of them being a meat inspector, which I know is very controversial, but <coughs> why not? And I'm sure John will have lots to say about that. Um, on farm requirements, we want to keep simple, so we envisage uh, each farmer having a clean concrete pad, uh, a pen, a safe pen to hold animals, uh, the layerage so that we would turn up with a stun box and connect it up. Clean water, power supply and also probably a loo and an office for human welfare resources and paperwork to be processed. Um, we would like to see a new stamp for on-farm slaughtered animals. We believe that that would produce a premium for the meat. Um, in fact, a bit like Morrison's are trying to do at the moment with uh, their British lamb, I think they're trying to introduce a blue passport. Our next step is to continue, which at the moment are constructive conversations with the FSA, uh, DEFRA and uh, APHA. Uh, we have a thought, which everyone might think we're crazy, but uh, we love it, is to speak to the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons to say, hey, why don't veterinary nurses be trained, set up a new course, uh, and why, why do you need a full vet to work out how to kill an animal? Normally they need to work out how to save them. So why not have a nurse come along who can be inspected um, and less cost? So we have got a design, we have got some costings, uh, which I literally got at nine o'clock last night, so <laughs> Uh, I can't really share them quite with you because I actually haven't read them all quite yet. But we are getting there, we need to put a business plan together and we need help. As I said earlier, we're not experts, but we're realising that experts are required to achieve what we want to achieve. So thank you. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw together the themes uh, which I think have come out. And the first is on what we heard yesterday, which is what are the public and policy good implications? In other words, let's not beat about the bush. The man who was standing here yesterday says, I'll give you money for public goods. What are they from avatars and on a small scale? Animal welfare, rural resilience, employment, uh, collaborative support and working. Um, that's, and by the way, all these are capital and ongoing and biodiversity. What I mean by that is the ability to slaughter and market and get value from locally appropriate breeds. Now that's a blatant piece of propaganda, but it's perfectly true from the chairman, the vice chair of the Rare Breed Survival Trust. But it's a very serious point. It's about how you add that value, and there is a public good. So, um, bluntly, there is a system that's gonna be in place. We need to work that system for this activity. Um, and I think we've got some really good pointers already, some very strong cases. Regulation. It is really simple to oversimplify this. Uh, regulation is a bit like communication. It means all things to all people. Um, we need to discover whether it's statutory or non-statutory. Half your problem come from the British Retail Consortium standards being applied as statutory. If you had to shoot somebody, luckily it wouldn't be the vet first, 
you shoot the, the planning control. Um, different regulation. We really need to understand in detail before we just say regulation is bad. How are we going to make it risk-based? Well, one of it seems to be if it really is anti-competitive for against large, for small against large, let's invoke the government SME criteria. Do we need some central support templates for um, critical control plans? Um, in terms of small-scale exemptions, we really need to understand what they need and what EU and non-EU need. And in terms of traceability, um, we need to understand that if that is going to underpin EU, non-EU, how we deliver that. And mo novel ways, so for example, if local authorities are going to regulate, how do you not get the local authority, not yours, obviously Cornwall, the local authority from hell, which then comes and regulates you. Well, there is a system, for example, called primary authority, which can set a national standard, which the avatar operators could buy into, and you've got a universal level playing field. And you use it already. So you're already using that. That's the kind of innovation we need. So lean to innovation. Where does my le levy money go? In part, it's gone to high definition carcass scanning. Why not use that for meat inspection? Because they're all gonna have CCTV now. How do we utilize what's already coming? All those forms. What we need, wake up Phil, what we need is a system that collates all the different information and passes it through a central government hub and then pushes it out in an automatic way. The government's just funded that, it's called the Livestock and Food Programme, built from the bottom up by producers and farmers. Let's start to utilise it for that. How do we know about traceability? Well, you know exactly where your animals are going, because he punches a hole in their ear and sends off a tissue sample, which is a unique gen genetic fingerprint from your pedigree and an the angus. Now, anybody who of a certain age watches black and white Colditz films will see men with knives faking rubber stamps. A rubber stamp is so 19th century. Um, genomic traceability, we need to use these. The cost of that is in economies of scale. We need to use these modern technologies and innovation to make that work. And then, oh, we, we can't produce it because it might go to an export market. We know exactly where it came from. You'll know that, that our it was born, because it will be in your notebooks. <laughs> I'm sure you'll know the hour. Um, and in, in terms of um, the FSA and, the, um, and how they work, they are flexible. For example, they've just brought out a um, proposal to um, make it easier for butchers to use um, pet food. We need to encourage that innovation culture in the regulators. So, I just wanted to capture those, those points in our discussion, because I think there's a huge amount of really good stuff that's come out. Um, I would come back to the key point uh, that I think some more work needs to be done to understand what the regulatory burdens really are, the actual burdens versus the ones that have been imposed without um, a solid base. Um, what I'd like to do now is throw this open to the uh, audience and um, apparently uh, I've discovered this conference, you can't ask a question without Patrick being the first one. <laughs> so, Patrick. My question is, can we hear from Joel, because he's running an abattoir. Well, we bought a uh, slaughterhouse, our local federal inspector slaughterhouse, about six years ago, uh, Therese and I, um, and it was owned by an 80-year-old couple who was getting older, and uh, they owned it about 40 years, and we got scared. If we lose the slaughterhouse, that's our ticket to our customers. And so I took the owners, Tommy and Irma, out to dinner and I said, uh, so what's your succession plan? Well, they didn't have one. So I started a, it took me 10 years to find a partner to go in with us on it because I didn't want to own a slaughterhouse, but we finally found a guy that bought the, that took the hook and said, yeah, I'll, I'll buy it. But he said, I won't buy it unless you come in as my partner because I don't want to buy it and then have you because at the time, Polyface was 41% of the business of the slaughterhouse. And uh, so we said we would, so we went in and bought it and we had 19 employees and 12 of them were over 70 years old. <laughs> so we, we bought a geriatric slaughterhouse. <laughs> it wasn't just the animals that were dying, let me tell you. 
<laughs> so, so uh, over the six years, we have um, we we now don't have anybody seventy years old, and didn't get sued for age discrimination. Uh, my partner went through that. He's actually the general manager, and and does it. But uh, when we bought it, we were Polyface was forty one percent of the business, and we had four uh, farm brands that we co packed that we did uh, fabrication for. And today, Polyface has doubled its business, but we're now only 21% of the slaughterhouse business, and we have 85 local farm brands that we pack for, fabricate. So we've been, we've really uh, instituted, one of the things that we did early on was uh, we did a year of classes for farmers on local marketing and branding to try to take the stigma and the intimidation off of market access. That was very, very successful. Um, another big thing that we've done um, is that we have changed our pricing from, uh, a, for, from a per animal price to all of our pricing is now customized for the work done and the weight. So all of our pricing is now by the weight of the animal and by the number of packages that the animal does. It's not fair to charge the same price for somebody that wants to make five pound, five pound uh, ground packages and the guy that wants to do one pound ground packages, that's a lot more labor and work to make those packages. So, so anyway, um, by me being a partner now in the business, I brought a, a farmer friendly, you know, uh, 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 kind of thing to the management like this to customize this. We are actually right now putting the finishing touches on a half million dollar um, value added room. That's our, our last big, uh, big expansion. So we'll now be able to go, we'll be able to kill on one end of the plant and we can come out with lunch meat and pepperoni out the other end of the plant. So we'll be the first kind of community, very small abattoir that can go all the way through to a finished uh, package, charcuterie, smoked products, and things like that. We're very excited about that. So, um, so that, that's where we are, and uh, it's been it's been quite a journey. And fortunately, he's an engineer and enjoys paperwork, so we've gotten along very well. Because <laughs> um, if I was there, I'd be postal. Um, so, so just a, 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 a couple of other things. We also process poultry on our farm under the, I really appreciated the, uh, the 10,000 bird exemption. In the U.S., we have a public law 9492, which is a 20,000 bird federal exemption on farm uh, processing. And that is one reason why we have been able to do our pasture poultry business the way we have, was because we have this wonderful exemption that allowed us to get in without much cost. Uh, early on, we did some uh, sampling, and the uh, the samples that had the, um, the the food safety inspection service uh, stamp on them averaged 3,600 um, CFU per mil of, of bacteria uh, cultured, and uh, ours averaged 133 with no chlorine and no an antimicrobials. So I hope that shows that's a, did you catch 3,600 to 133. Um, and we didn't use any chlorine, and they used 40, 40 chlorine dredges. So um, uh, there is an advantage in not processing every day on the same floor in the same spot and letting. Now, those of you who read my book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, know that we've had our run-ins, and the government's tried to shut us down several times, um, claiming that uh, the air is inherently unsanitary. You can't allow a carcass to be exposed to open air because that's an inherently adulterated product. Um, yeah, this is real. Um, so my question is, you know, are we really wanting food safety or do we just want to wrap everything up in a big package of infrastructure? So I'm going to quit very quickly, but I want to go down several options because I, I'm always wanting to leave you with hope. And um, so there is the poultry exemption. Um, I am talking with members of Congress and senators. I've met with them about extending the 20,000 bird exemption to an equivalent amount of meat, pork, goats, uh, uh, milk, cheese, butter, all right? The fact is, in the U.S., we have lots of farmers um, now accessing the market because I publicized it so much, the uh, PL9492 exemption, and we have 
hundreds, if not thousands now, of farmers processing water right straight out on the field as, as, as uh, fert fert um, fertigation, fertilizer irrigation, and it, it just works great. Uh, so these exemptions can be ex extended either by number, by sales volume, or by pounds. For example, in Virginia, we just got a pickle bill uh, where a person can home can pickles up to $3,000 a year without any uh, uh, government oversight. So that was not by pounds, that was by sales volume, okay? Uh, the, the, the point is that, that it is easier to control things, keep things cleaner, you know, in a smaller operation than it is a larger. Doesn't mean all small operations are clean, don't misread this, but it, in general it's easier if you're running a very small uh, operation. You might not be aware that in the U.S. there is a burgeoning food sovereignty movement. This was started in Sedgwick, Maine. You can Google this up. Sedgwick, Maine food sovereignty movement. It's a one half page uh, uh, piece of legislation that they started. It quickly moved out through Maine and now it's moving around the country. Basically it says that in our political jurisdiction, these are all local, local things, townships in Maine, in our jurisdiction, anybody can engage in any kind of food commerce they want to within the confines of our township without a bureaucrat being involved. In other words, if you're a neighbor and you're my neighbor and, and, and I want to go to you and, and ask you to you know, milk a cow for me uh, and I buy the milk or the cheese or whatever within our township, again, it recognizes scale. We're not saying you can export it to Thailand. We're not saying you can put it in all these. But these food sovereignty things are within the locality. That, that, so that, that is one option that's really uh, starting to take hold in the U.S. and getting some really legs under it. We're very excited to see it. Um, uh, by the way, the federal government's not happy about it. Um, <laughs> another, one, another one is to rename food. So you can sell it as pet food. Uh, in Florida, um, they've now got uh, legislation where you pay $25 a year to register a food item as pet food. And, and you can sell anything you want under this $25. So, so you can sell yogurt and kefir and cheese and, and, and whatever you want to sell uh, as pet food. There's a lady in uh, Minneapolis that uh, was selling cheese, didn't pass inspection. So she uh, called up the game commission and uh, asked you know, what does she need to do to sell fish food. They said really nothing, just has to be edible. So she now sells fish burger, fish, fish baked Colby, fish baked cheddar, fish baked Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> Not for human consumption. The next one is substitution. You can substitute. You can sell something else and give it away. Like the guy in Georgia that has a, a, a hunting dog. People come and buy the dog and he gives them half a hog because the dog has a very special diet. So they buy, they buy the dog for $500. He puts the half a hog of packages of meat in their car. They get to the end of the land, they open the door, the dog runs back home. <laughs> He sells, he sells that dog a hundred times a summer. <laughs> the next one is do it yourself. So there's a lady in Michigan. You can, you, can, you can process your own beef on your own land, okay? And so she sells, she, she rents for a dollar a year, she rents 10 foot by 10 foot sections of land to people and slaughters their beef on their land, <laughs> okay? And, um, and it, it works fine. Another thing you can do like this is you can sell the chicks and not charge, not sell the chickens when you're done. Rake, uh, um, uh, have your customers buy the chick and pay you a caretaker service fee, like like our, um, um, you know, like they used to do with the, the horse studs, um, uh, service fee. And finally. Finally, there is also a very growing thing, in fact, it looks like several of us are gonna convene a conference on this in the US, of, of absolute circumvention through private food buying clubs. And what these are, these are membership only investment private buying clubs, just like a golf club, a country club. They're not public, they're completely private, but, in, but, but what you do is you invest and your investment then is subtracted from the food commerce within the club. It's a spin-off of the community supported agriculture. You see the legal term that gets you is in commerce. So if you can keep the trade out of commerce, 
then you can come out from under the um, you know the the uh, the inspection uh, requirements. And these are just popping up now all over these private food buying clubs. And I think it's going to be a real opportunity for the future. To here's the deal: you can either turn cartwheels to comply with everything, or you can turn cartwheels to just opt out and not comply. <laughs> that is an option. And sometimes I'm not opposed to all compliance. I mean, obviously, I own a federal, federal uh, a slaughterhouse, so you know, I, I live in both of these worlds. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I wanted to present the non-compliance option for those of you who are rebellious enough uh, to actually to actually think about um, non-compliance. But the, the the food buying clubs are are real. They've been tested in the courts. Uh, it is an ongoing uh, battle but uh, it, it, it's really working. And finally, the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, FTC LDF, we have in the U.S. Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund uh, has, has brought all sorts of, of, uh, of opportunity to people like us. Um, um, one story and I'm done. Uh, so we had a chef call us he, in a panic. He said the health department was just here. They threw out your eggs. They said your eggs are not legal to sell because they don't have a federal inspection uh, buzz on. I said, um, uh, and of course we service 50 restaurants. If they're illegal there, they're illegal in all the other 49. I said, give me the citation that she cited and give me her, uh, her name and number. Okay, so he gave that to me. I hung up with him. I called Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. Now, this is a deal where we pay $125 a year membership and we get 24 7 real time access to food compliance attorneys who give their, who, who, who work gratis for the members. Okay, so it's a pool of money that then the attorneys use to give us, and these guys are good because this is all they do. They, all they do is this uh, food, food compliance stuff. So I called, I called them, attorney answered the phone, I said, here's what happened, here's the citation, here's the, the, the person, the bureaucrat that did it. Fine, hung up with him. 24 hours later, the health department apologized for overstepping. They said, we were wrong, uh, you're exactly right, it's, it's fine to sell. I ask you, how long would it taken, have taken me as a dumb farmer to get that kind of concession from the bureaucracy? So what, what you learn is in negotiation, equal has to talk to equal. You can't have the janitor talking to the CEO. The janitors have to talk to each other. The CEOs have to talk to each other. And when you and I are going in on bended knee to the, to the, to the power of the state and the bureaucracy, we're not negotiating from a position of strength. But when you go in with an attorney and with somebody who's, who's knowledgeable in the system, preferably a retired bureaucrat going to bat for you, then you're starting to deal with equals and equals and you actually get somewhere. So that's the story and, uh, and uh, enjoy. So we'll have some questions to the audience. I'll probably take several of the time. And just to give you, uh, just uh, brings down to earth and bump. I suppose when you're talking about take back control and chlorinated chicken, the reaction depends on who you're hearing it from. <laughs> uh, questions? Actually, to your reference there to chlorinated chicken is interesting, isn't it, Tim? Because I would always encourage people to chlorinate a chicken out of an industrial chicken plant. Seems eminently sensible because after all of the FSA controls on those industrial chickens, they are still basically unsafe to eat until the consumer makes them safe by cooking them. In fact, haven't Sainsbury's now created a touch-free chicken which never leaves a packet. So the point I really want to make is the Food Standards Agency are policing a system with reams and reams of regulations and paperwork but the chicken coming out at the end of those plants is absolutely unsafe to eat until in America they wash it in chlorine. I think that's great because at least you can then say to the housewife, okay, basically you can do what you like with this, the bacteria are dead. So I just want to come back to the point you made. If we, we need to be bold here. If we're going to craft truly sustainable structure within our meat industry, within the artisan sector, we can't start from where we are now. We're in where we are now, and John knows this only too well, because of the absolute nightmare that's been the red meat industry since BSE broke out. It's been carnage caused by the FSA. The only thing that has been achieved over all those years is justify their existence. The hoops that you're jumping through to create a micro abattoir are absolutely unjustified. 
I just want to check with Natasha. Animal waste that John's had all these problems with, why can that possibly be dangerous? If it can come out the back end of a bullock in a field as a cow pat, and we've heard today what wonderful stuff that is, why the minute that you take the gut content out in an abattoir, does it become dangerous? It isn't dangerous. That's bullshit from the FSA. <laughs> the other thing is, the old-fashioned system of local authority cold inspection, just can you confirm, Natasha, there is absolutely nothing that you cannot tell about the health of an animal from cold inspecting the offals. So you local authority meat inspectors, look at the offals of a carcass. You know everything you need to know about whether that meat is fit to eat. And the final point is, why the hell should there be any limitation? Either that meat is fit to eat anywhere in the world, or it isn't. No, I'm not. So I'm not, this isn't yeah, a personal point, just I'm just it, asking yeah. the question. Um, it's commonly known that the longer the food chain, the more potential there is to have weaknesses within those chain as we've seen with horse meat. Would localising the control of small abattoirs help to reduce um, the risk of food fraud by redistributing resources where they are really needed? I mean, we farm on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, we send, we actually send animals we find a very low intensity way. We have a, a thousand yows and we have under a hundred cattle. The whole place is an SSSI. Everything's grass fed. Everything uh, is done really in agreement with SNH, Scottish National Heritage. In order to make sure that the people who work there have pride, we're really keen that we have local meat, which we can sell in the local community. We have to send our animals, if we want them to be slaughtered, we have to send them to Mull which is at least as one on the west coast of Scotland. It takes an hour and a half from where we are to get to Oban. It then takes an hour and a half, 45 minutes on the ferry, an hour and a half in total to get across to Mull. Really, by the, then, the, then the animals, frankly, we've got to leave them, um, and they do get butchered up, and they make, pretty good, so they make pretty good job of doing that. And then hopefully somebody else might come back and bring them back, or other times we've got to spend another day to go there and bring them back again. But we do that, we do that partly because it's actually pride of the people who work there. And it's hugely important that people do have that. But that just give you a little vignette of, of what life's like in, in that area. Another point I'd like to make about that kind of thing is we have venison. Now, fortunately in Scotland, there is, you know, if I shoot a deer, um, I can sell it in its skin. If I skin it and take it to the pub, that's illegal, but if I can persuade them to take in a skin and skin it, that's okay. What actually happens in Scotland is almost all the venison goes to, it's quite a good company actually, in, in, in Scotland, it's almost all gets, we take it to a chiller in Loch Gilpet, and then all around Scotland people come in vans, and they take that up to Inverness. And there is a company there, a very successful company, do a good job because at least they're collecting our stuff and paying for it, and they, they butcher it. And what actually happens is, is the row pretty well all go to Denmark because they like that. All the sort of, uh, all the stags and everything else pretty well goes to Bavaria and the southern part of Germany because they like that. Um, we re-import stuff from them. We re-import the sort of rubbish stuff which we make into Veni burgers. Well, we don't do that personally, but other people do. But if you go around Scotland, the interesting thing, and you buy venison in a local restaurant, the chances are they don't know where it's come from. It's probably come from miles away. It's been a long journey, it's up and down. And really that's the, the, largely the fact of life. Now, the, it, there are other places that do it differently, but that's generally the case from where we are in terms of what happens to our stuff. So I'm just making, making the observation that there are an awful lot of things going on in all of this. And, hugely important to have things like the experiments of having mobile slaughterhouses. I think it's a huge difference. And, and I know you just referred to the Livestock Information Programme. I just want people to know that that is a programme. There is a new programme of uh, livestock identification and traceability that is under discussion at the moment to replace everything that we've got. And that was really brought to my mind earlier this week when, you know, if you think back to our sector, the, the sheep sector, the investment that would, go on, that would have gone into um, uh, the identification of sheep over this last... Uh... Who are you that you're talking about sheep sector? What's your position? 
Oh, sorry, I'm... Uh, <laughs> sorry, Pat, hello, Patrick. I'm Phil Stocker. I'm the Chief Executive of the National Sheep Association. Thank you. It's very nice to meet you. But, um, <laughs> um, I, I but, li we livened the session up, didn't we? <laughs> but if you think about the investment that's gone into the, the sheep industry in terms of uh, tagging, identification of sheep, and movements reporting, all in the aim of uh, disease protection in this country, farmers are fined cross-compliance penalties if they get any breaches whatsoever, all in the sake of disease security. And I took part in a national disease uh, exercise earlier this week where it was, um, it was found that after day around eight of a disease outbreak, we still couldn't trace 25% of our movements in this country. So you know, after all that investment, uh, in the, in the aim of disease security, we're no further forward than we were before. But anyway, that's not what I want to talk about. That was just something extra. That was the Livestock Information Program. I just want to mention about technology because um, there's two things really. One, I don't think we've talked about AHDB very much, or not just AHDB, but our levy bodies in general through this conference. And I don't think we should ignore just how influential they are within agriculture. And uh, they should be here today. I don't, th I don't think anyone's here from the levy bodies, but you know, they should be here. They should be engaging with this. They are using our levy money. Um, and sometimes you get the sense that actually it's other people that are making decisions about how that money, where that money should be directing agriculture. I need to be careful what I say there, but uh, you know, we do need to engage with our levy, levy bodies. They are there working with some really good t technology. And I spoke with Bob about some uh, 3D masks that they're using already for farmer training, where you can stand in a room like this and it's uh, connected to, uh, you know, through Bluetooth technology or something. Um, and you can stand with a mask in front of you, you can see the carcass right in front of you, and you can walk around it, or someone can spin the carcass and you can visualize it, you can see the whole thing. All you can't do is touch it. You know, so it's uh, you know that sort of technology for inspection and close inspection is already there. And then the final thing I just wanted to mention was the issue of labour, and it's always an interesting one to me that within uh, our industry still, you know, we've got uh, a very diverse sector with an awful lot of family farms, large farms, small farms, upland farms, lowland farms. A very very diverse se se uh, sector. We've got 83 breed societies affiliated with us, so that gives an indication of the genetic diversity that we've got. Um, it's a low capital sector to an extent, you know, not a, a relatively low investment to, to, to enter that sector. That's one of the reasons we're seeing lots of young people coming in, uh, access to land as well. We've heard a lot about that today. Our sector is very, um, and this again isn't, it's not a criticism on migrant workers, but again, there's been a real spotlight on migrant labor uh, in this industry and in this country over recent years. Uh, but if you look at our sector at the farm level, the reliance on migrant labor is virtually zero, with the exception of shearing. And again, that's a very different issue. But uh, you know, the reliance on migrant labor is virtually zero. And it's not until you get to that processing end, you see that reliance come in. And you've got a very diverse on-farm sector um, with a very intensive and centralized processing sector. And again, if you look at the labor needs, and the labor skills and the value of that labor, they're very, very different. And I think it's another public interest, public good that we should be considering. After Brexit, can we expect a more palatable and easier time of it in that field, Natasha? Now, I'm going to ask the um, four panel members just to, uh, uh, and I gave them literally about one minute warning, of the two things you would change to move things forward, what would you change? So, we'll just go through and see if there is a, any commonality It would be interesting. I, I think it's really important that we treat this subsector of the meat industry as an entity and we look at it in the round, in the whole, and look at all the aspects of it, rather than pick one or two things that we would change, which will make it work for a little while, but won't solve the problem. We've got, this is our last chance. We've got to make it sustainable. We've got to make the solutions long term, not just at an elastoplast. And I think that's just one I'd change. I think regulation is mine. Um, it, it, it means that we have to have regulation that's fit for purpose and that is risk based, not rule based. We don't want somebody reading out from a pad just saying, this is exactly what you've got to do. I've got an example, beast of beast, minus 15. Brother sees a fly screen into the awful house, thinks ideal time to get it fixed. It's starting to look a bit shabby. Um, vet comes in, he sent it to the engineer. He's told the vet, he sent it to the engineer to get the new um, strips put on it. 
and the vet reports him for not having a fly screen up in minus 15. <laughs> because it said in the regulation that there had to be a fly screen to that awful house. We've got numerous examples of where the regulations make it that a farmer can deliver animals to an abattoir with his children and unload them. But if a young man who's on his MVQ in butchery stands holding a gate, he will get a letter because he's not qualified in animal welfare. Can you imagine how annoying that is for the slaughterman who stood there having to take that, that his own lad can't be there with the animals but children can unload? Because in the regulations it says that farmers are exempt. These are the kind of things that we have to put up with and actually raise our staff who've got 30 years experience, we know they're very experienced and we have to pick them up off the floor when these kind of things happen. And it's very hard to be able to do that. So my, mine is regulation and following on what Tim said, I think the waste removal is the next one. If we can actually make that, that, that ends up being back to a positive where it was before and we can get local authorities to, in, to include that in part of the recycling and, and generate from it rather than being a cost that is my number two. Actually, on this last one, actually, farmers aren't fully exempt because I'm not allowed to walk them up the last 10 yards. All right. Okay. okay. All right. Then. I can take them all the way from the farm, rear them all their lives, and then the last 10 yards up the race, I'm not allowed to take them there. I have to be supervised for that. <laughs> Never mind. But uh, he lived with this. Um, my one is actually, I've really got the one uh, which I think is, a, is going to be a major hurdle. Uh, for anybody looking at building a micro abattoir on their farm at the moment and that is under uh, legislation at the moment planning um, have micro abattoirs classified as uh, sui generis without classification uh, while all other legislation is agricultural and this means that uh, building control defaults to it being industrial uh, which therefore has a totally different set of rules and it comes extremely complex trying to balance them off. And for me, that one thing would make a huge difference for anybody else in time looking to open their own micro Thank you. I think I'd like to see the exemptions brought across to the red meat, the small red meat sector. Um, there's obviously negotiation on how the restrictions on local and, and numbers. What I put in the presentation were just examples of what's already there and what could potentially be um, brought across as equivalents. And um, for the basis of what Tim has said, where we see BRC standards or any assured standards sometimes enforced on premises that don't aren't parts of those schemes, um, a specific industry guide agreed between regula regulators and industry for the small red meat scale sector with. There's one now for the catering guide where it will tell you specifically what the law says and then it will give you ways that you could comply with it and then it also separates best practice from legal requirements. So I think if we could have something like that for the small scale sector um, would help.